Hi, this is your host Sapun Bhartia and welcome to TFR Let's Talk. And today we have with us Brandon Jung, VP of Ecosystem at DAP9. Brandon, it's great to have you on the show. Hey, thank you for having me. It's my pleasure to host you here. But if I'm not wrong, this is the first time I'm talking not only to you, but also to TAP9. So I would love to know a bit about the company. How old is the company? What problem you folks are trying to solve for users? Sure. Uh, so the company TAP9, we're about 10 years old. Uh, we have always been in the space of making developers more productive, uh, but we've really landed as the founder or the first company to build generative AI for code. Uh, so we're the first company to use generative AI for code and for developers. And so our mission is to make developers happier and more productive uh, and kind of abstract and give them access to all the goodness that uh, that is all the fun world of generative AI, but doing it in a secure and safe manner uh, anywhere they want to use it. So, because you folks, uh, you know, have been, as you said, around for a while, so you have seen the whole evolution in the ecosystem and market. But talk about your journey of AI to Gen AI. We were semantic AI before Gen of AI, and really, you nailed the the statement. The first uh, real model out the door that opened that uh, as an opportunity would have been GPT two, or kind of first thing out of Open AI, which is an open model, uh, and Tab Nine adopted that and used it before anyone even knew what GPT was. So this is when OpenAI was super small. So we've used AI for a while. Obviously, the generative aspect of these models is, for us now, five, six, six years old. And when we look at it, I, I think we can get into this discussion, but um, Tab9, the evolution of the models was has been super rapid, continues to go extremely quickly. And there's a lot of debates over whether the big singular models will be the way to go, or we're going to get to more specific tailored model, that's Tab 9's view. Um, but we've been really using, and we regularly use every generative AI model pretty much under the sun, uh, and we're agnostic. So in some ways we kind of operate as the, one way of thinking of us is we're the company that looks at all the fun models out there and figure out which ones are the best for the code use case, right? They can be used to do all sorts of fun stuff, but at least for us, you know, we care where they do Python and JavaScript and maybe a little COBOL real well versus, you know, creating a, an amazing new image or video. Gen AI is playing, you know, a lot of very critical role. Is it has kind of passed the hype cycle. Yes, we talk a lot about consumer space. I want to talk about the enterprise space. When we look at AI or Gen AI, are we looking at something which is a tool, uh, assistant, or some something that is going to replace us? Uh, I think it's a tool for sure. So we certainly, if we're going to use sort of a simple analogy, I think we view uh, the capabilities of generative AI more like a um, a suit, more like an Iron Man suit around a developer rather than replacing a developer. Uh, and that's a different view. There's a number of other companies that believe a whole lot more in a, a, a fully automated option. The truth of the matter is that these, the models and the process, particularly in an enterprise, require a level of oversight and integration and, and human understanding that they are just simply nowhere close to being able to deliver yet. So uh, we definitely look at it as augmented. Um, and, and to your point, from a new standpoint, yeah, they're relatively new. Uh, on the team that founded Kubernetes, yes. The goal I think we're gonna see is for these models to become much like Kubernetes. Simple, just a part of everything and boring. And I think over time, these models will be incorporated a lot of things with the right controls around them, used correctly, not just by themselves, will become a whole lot more boring. And we probably won't be talking about, you know, the difference of one model versus another uh, if we fast forward anything five years from now. And let's now talk about uh, the actual impact of these AI-assisted tools, AI-assisted coding on the team's developers. The tools, first off, I think everyone will need to adopt them as a developer. And the reason is there are things that these tools do uh, around code discovery, code suggestions, um, that when used well and for a strong developer will be very useful, but they're gonna be useful for any new developer that comes into a team. Uh, what we're seeing these move from is a generally useful tool for like open source development to now as you customize and personalize uh, these models becoming really valuable when you bring in a new developer. So you might have just hired and worked really hard to hire a, you know, one of the top developers. Your goal is to get them in, make them productive, help them understand your process as best as possible. And then as you evolve, 
continue to instantiate those best practices across an entire team. Um, and so, you know, the first step of, of, of generative AI is really expansive, again, is normal. Hey, let a lot of things bloom. And we're now in, you know, on the back end of the hype cycle, and we're starting to apply these where we're putting controls and constraints around these models in order to bring the highest value and to really bring trust to the models. And the models themselves won't be trust fully trustworthy by themselves. So they will require application and other testing and everything wrapped around them. And that's um, that's what'll be critical. Code happens to be really good because actually a lot of that's already built in into the software development lifecycle. So that's not surprisingly why generative AI for code is probably the first place you're seeing most adoption because it has a lot of the controls already built into the general process that everyone uses. Let's talk about the solutions you're offering. Is it a SaaS-based solution or is it something folks can also use on their own data center? And who do you cater to? Is it a big enterprise, a small enterprise, a startups? The not popular answer is actually technically all of them, but it's kind of where we started. So we started offering it as a, it's a SaaS offering as the default. Um, and that is now being used by over a million developers every month. However, the vast majority of what we're focused on is supporting enterprises. And in that case, almost all of them want to know exactly what model they're using, the data that went into the model, controls the data in and out of the model, personalization of that model, and run it in many cases either on-prem, uh, in their VPC or on a cloud somewhere where they have full control. And even a number of customers that we literally sneaker net, like walk in the software and it's completely air gapped from the rest of the world. So. That's where we spend most of our time, but the the history of the company is a PLG motion, product like growth. And so we have a million devs that can use the SaaS version. And so we kind of get the plus of both worlds. But the vast majority of where Tab 9's focused is really an enterprise company. When it comes to these you know, enterprises or small organizations who want to leverage Gen AI, from your perspective, when it comes to AI assistant coding, what are the areas that you feel, hey, this is what they should leverage Gen AI for? This is where they get real value out of it? Because sometimes, every time we hear a new buzzword, new emerging technologies, companies, they do want to tip their toes in it. Sometimes they go overboard and they put all their eggs in the basket. Sometimes they do very careful analysis that, hey, whether it suits for me or not. Right now, everybody is looking at Gen AI as a hammer and they are looking at everything in their organization as a nail. How, how, what approach should, you, what approach would you suggest? So I'd suggest as normal, start with use cases. So look at a use case and uh, I think code is a great initial use case because it's a couple things. It's not external facing. So grabbing a generative AI solution and using it to say, communicate with your customers. High risk because you don't really know how it operates and you're not really familiar with it. And it doesn't have a check on it, right? Whatever comes in goes right back to a customer. You didn't even see it. So we're maybe not the right place to start, although there's great systems for that. But I think the reason we think code and I think why code is the first place is it's an internal. It's a very structured language. If you think about it, coding languages of, of like a Python is very structured. So these models work very well, the more highly structured the language is. So that's another plus. And then probably third and most importantly, the software development lifecycle already has security checks and everything else built into it. So it fits really nicely as a part of a process that already has checks and balances in place. Uh, so I think that's probably both why we see adoption and I'm obviously biased, but I think that would be the natural place for most companies to start. I think the other part that a company can learn in this process is, look, we've been doing data and AI and you know, big data has been talked about forever and the same principles apply. You still have to have good data. You still have to know where your data is. And that's a process that just becomes more important with generative AI because whatever goes into the model, as all AI functions, good data in, good data out. Bad data in, bad data out. So I would say if that's the other aspect that I've found many companies have kind of delayed on being really good around their data cleanliness and, and data practices, but are now becoming better at it because the the value of having good data is you can put it in a generative AI solution and the use case is better. So in some ways, I think it's pulling us to be better about our data stewardship issues we've historically all had. Um, but I think code's probably the easiest one to start 
albeit I'm probably a little bit biased. Now, when companies do plan to using uh, these uh, Gen AI solutions, of course, we are looking at Tab9 here, but uh, they also leverage a lot of cloud infrastructure. Uh, AWS is there, Azure is there, GCP is there, of course, Oracle, IBM, they all have their cloud, cloud offering, they all have their own Gen AI. Uh, when you look at Tab9, are you aligned with any of these cloud providers, the kind of Gen AI tools they want, or it doesn't matter, customers have the freedom to, to you know, plug in what and where they want it? The latter. So as we are not a large cloud, we work well with Amazon, with Google, with Oracle, with VMware, with DigitalOcean, um, even parts of Microsoft, who's naturally kind of our, our primary competitor. But tab nine, we do build a model. We build a model that is based on only fully permissive open source and is highly secure. That's a requirement that a lot of companies, particularly European companies with the AI Act that just got passed, are saying, I need to have that. So we still build that and we have that capability. But at the same point, we aren't tied to a model. So I'm not an open AI shop or a Gemini shop or a Cohere shop or an Anthropic shop. I'm all the above. So if those are models that someone finds and thinks is useful and they want to leverage, you can switch those models in and use them with tab nine. So that's the optionality. We've designed the, the, the uh, platform to do that so that uh, you can either take whatever's out there on those big models, or again, some of our leading customers are already building their own models based off of some open stuff from a llama or from a, you know, uh, uh, I want to say graphite, um, graphite from Goop, from IBM. Um, so there's lots of options and tab nine will offer one for a specific use case that's very highly secure. And then we'll offer, off, offer optionality for the rest, because to be honest, um, as it turns out, we do not have billions and billions of dollars to build models every, all around the, around the clock. So we believe those will continue to evolve as they specialize. Um, we do good evaluation of them and we help our customers with some good data on which ones we're seeing work best. Um, but it's an exciting time and there's a lot of money going into those models. So what we're, we're looking forward to is those continue to evolve. Can you talk about the impact of tab nine technologies, uh, on developers time, resources and cost. When we look at what developers and a developer adopting using tab nine, and it's evolved over time because as a product originally did really code completion. So finish your line, add you two, three more lines, and then chat, as I think everyone's very familiar with kind of the chat GPT style, that introduction has seen larger chunks of code. Um, what we've seen developers early on adopt this predominantly for is to a lot of use cases, but um, either they're kind of run in two modes. I know where I'm going and I want to code and I just want it to go really fast and keep up with me, right? So think stream of conscious. I know exactly what I'm doing, but I want it to put my variables and, and everything else in it. Kind of a one development option. And the other option is more of an exploratory. I may be new to a company and I don't know how we do an APIs for map calls. Is it, you know, is it MapQuest? Is it Apple? Is it Google? How do I go about doing that? And how do I reuse what already exists inside of an enterprise? Um, across the board, numbers wise, we're seeing uh, developers obviously vary, but we're seeing developers in the upwards of mid 50 to 60% of their code um, coming from tab nine. So um, we don't keep any of the data. So I'd, usually someone will accept perhaps like a large test case and then they might go in some tweaks and stuff. Um, another one, honestly, that I think is pretty encouraging is we're seeing a huge amount of usage for, you know, unit testing and other testing uh, uses. And that's great because honestly, we never test our software well enough. You really can't. And so that's a case that most developers tend to avoid or don't do real well. Uh, or it's the last thing on their list. I'm done with it. Do I want to go run a build a bunch of, you know, unit tests? And the answer is like, no, I don't. Being able to just add those instantaneously into the process, really good. It just ups everyone's best practices. So some degree, I think that's a lot of what we're seeing is the undifferentiated lifting that might not be done or is it done well or isn't as focused on um, is, I think, getting better. So I'm very encouraged about where it's going um, from that aspect. We are kind of living in an era, and we are lucky to be living in an era where a lot of innovation is happening, which also means that technologies are evolving, changing very fast. 
how do you also help uh, customers in kind of whatever investments they are making, they are future proof as well. It's not like, hey, after two or five years from something new will come and suddenly all this is gone. In terms of future proofing or the evolution of this space, to your point, like it's on hype cycle, maybe it's a little on the back, but in, but so much money and so much change. So we've kind of like broadly speaking, we think of the, the, um, the space, anytime someone's building something kind of three pillars, it's your data. Like where does the data come from, where you get it? That's key. The models and then the application layer. And Tab9 is very focused on the application layer and then giving flexibility with the models because the models are the part that um, they're moving the fastest and they would be the hardest, uh, the, the highest risk of lock-in, if you think about it. Uh, if you're locked into a GPT model, that means it's running in Azure, you're all in a Microsoft world. And again, that might be okay, but I think you're highlighting and our customers are telling the same kind of thing. I may want to start there, but what if something great comes out? How have you thought about it? So uh, from our aspect, we think really about Tabnet giving the right suggestion to the right user at the right time uh, in the right place. So there's some, it's, it's, it's workflow. I mean, in fairness, like it's overly simple and I don't want to make it overly simple, but it's good workflow with a, a backend that's flexible, uh, knowing that what I can tell you is I don't know where this is going. And anyone that tells you does is like, hey, that's awesome. I'm glad they do because we don't. Uh, so we've kind of just designed it from the get-go to enable customers to to pick up that innovation as they go, or if they build the innovation on their own. And I actually think we'll see a lot of customers start building these muscles around these models, not the big ones, but smaller ones, and they will be very powerful, useless for other things outside, say, an enterprise, but for specific use cases, extremely powerful. And so we want to enable uh, customers and help them to build those, run those, if that's their direction as well. You folks also announce integrations with, you know, a lot of tools, technology around there, you know, recently. Uh, can you talk a bit about those integrations, those support, and was, uh, what does it mean for customers, not only of uh, Tab9, but also customers of, let's say, uh, GPT you know, 4.0 and other things? So the principle of being open and, and flexible, we uh, enable Tab9 to run on any platform. So again, if you want to run it yourself, you and you have a cloud or uh, infrastructure, that's an option. Um, and the other way is giving people access to models. So if you think about two areas that customers care about, where do I run it? And maybe they don't care at all, like you run it, that's a SaaS, great, we can take care of that too. Or maybe I want it, you know, air gapped. And then the other aspect is really access to models uh, and that from that standpoint, we continue to work. As I said, we've worked with Cohere, we work with Anthropic, we work with Google with Gemini, we work with GPT 4.0, we work with Mistral. So, you know, Llama. So those are all, you know, really very powerful models. And, and our goal is to give them access. And, and when you think about it, it's like, if you want Llama on AWS through Bedrock, great. If you're looking for Llama on OCI or you more, you want Cohere on OCI on Oracle, great, you get it. And so, some customers come with no opinion, right? And then we just give them, we, we give them their options and help them like sort through it. And others come with a very set opinion of, hey, I need to run this on, you know, on Oracle and I want to use Llama, their Llama, you know, 80 billion model for the chat capability. And I need you guys to do all the high speed, um, you know, code completion. Great. So again, uh, our goal is just to give that choice uh, and I say this personally because I'm not nearly smart enough to figure out how that's going to play out. So, um, and I think in the space, if we look at it, in the rest of it, most companies are either a model company or a platform company. And so naturally, they have motivations if you're a platform company. You want it to run on your platform and you want to turn the crank on usage. And that's great. Uh, uh, we want access to that if that's what a customer wants. Um, but we don't have any motivation as a company other than getting the right model, right suggestion to the user with the right security and personalization and kind of go from there. Where is AI, as I said, coding heading? And uh, because a lot of companies, they are putting a lot of invest, you know, Apple is totally baking it into their tools. NVIDIA is, has become a trillion dollar company because of that. So there is a lot of buzz around it right now, but where realistically you see things are heading? Sure, so evolution from AI for code, it's historically kind of really been ID right where you write your code. Uh, but if you sort of look across the whole software development life cycle, uh, I'd say think of those as a whole bunch of under, under 
very interesting, very important data sets that would customize if you're an enterprise, your model. So understanding what's going on in JIRA and Confluence on requirements, your data coming out of your repositories. So if you're storing it in like a Bitbucket, GitHub, GitLab, or you know a Perforce or something, there's data there. You go into your security, all your security vulnerabilities, best practices, even your your partners. So think you know you're doing development, you're doing Kubernetes development. I want all the best practices from CNCF. So there's a bunch of data sets that feed into um, a model and a customized uh, suggestions that matter a lot to, to, to a developer. So I think what we're seeing is we started in a very narrow, uh, use all the code that's sort of publicly available, like you know the pile and big, big open source code sets. And now we're starting to add and weight new data sets into that cut across the whole development life cycle. So think of like there's a model, you have a model that cuts across all of your de uh, development. And that model then makes those suggestions into, I'm a product manager and I want to write requirements. Okay, uh, here's my requirements. Oh, here's what's, what have we already built? What are all the microservices that you might go leverage? So a developer comes and says, oh, that's a good idea. Oh, I need to build this microservice, but I can reuse these five, right? So that's kind of, I think, where we're going to evolve on it uh, as we connect more data from different sources into, you know, a, a, a generative AI kind of so, um, custom model, if you think about it. And that'll be unique. Some will be very simple, direct. I'm doing straightforward, you know, front-end PHP development. Okay, maybe that's just a straight good PHP model, uh, but you may be doing, you know, you got a custom COBOL model <laughs> that no one's ever seen. Like that's going to be super unique and a bunch of other different data sets, data is going to feed into building that as a great model. But um, it's it's building the, back to that previous analogy, I think what we're looking to help build is the best iron suit for a company, for a developer in a company environment. I think along the lines, we're gonna be you very useful for an open source developer or a general developer as well. But the harder problem is to really customize that suit with all the data and uh, suggestions that are unique to a organization or an enterprise. As you work with organizations to help them with the AI such coding, do you also sense, feel some fear, some hesitation because AI, especially LLMs, they're as good as the data sets, the source they're using, you know, so they are dipping their, you know, fingers into the company data also, uh, where companies are fear that, hey, you know what, this is too much, or you're like, no, they don't have any such uh, apprehensions when it comes to Gen AI technologies. No, they all have that apprehension. Uh, it depends on which team you're asking. So if you went and asked the security team, they're going to be like, absolutely have a contention on that. If you ask the software development team on it, they're probably going to be like, ah, what's most judicious? But at any decent sized company, this is a core question that gets asked. And, um, you know, there, there's control. There's two sides of the control. There's control of what goes into the model that you're using, like is the are my are my are, are my suggestions or the suggestions I'm getting is the data I use to get those being kept, and that that's pretty straightforward to say no. And I think most companies have gotten much better around saying no, we won't store your data. But a lot of companies are asking the other question is what went into the model because whatever went in the model can come out of the model, and very transparently, most of the models don't know or can't tell you it's a black box, and I think. For some companies, that's not a big pro not a problem. A large number of companies, it is a challenge. Like they really want to know what's in the box because, again, while we think it's magic, it's just AI 101, good data in, data out. So what data went in because I'm going to be liable for whatever data comes out and I need to be able to stand on that in front of, you know, in Europe on the AI Act, you're going to have to be able to do that in six to months to a year. Um, so it's doable. But there's some trade-offs, and these models love data. So, you know, from an engineering standpoint, there's a little bit of push and pull. If you're building a model, you want as much data as possible. And so you're going to grab it from every possible place you can get it. But the trade-off is as you grab more and more data from more and more places, uh, most it's very difficult to keep track of what you just went, put in. And so now you end up with that natural piece of, I built a good model because I, I, I looked under the covers at a lot of things. 
but maybe I looked under the covers at something that you don't want, and that correlation's going to be one we're all going to have to wrestle with. You folks, you know, just made some announcements a few weeks ago, uh, but I am kind of also curious. I know there are a lot of things you cannot share at this point, but what to expect from Tabnet? What are the things that you folks are working on that, you know, your users should be excited about? Sure. I, I mean, it's not a big secret. It's been what we focused on. So being very transparent, it's about, you know, control. So uh, adoption, these tools require control. For, for, for people to feel comfortable with them as they should anything should like know. So using, working a lot around uh, giving very, you know, levels of control, both what goes into the model, how what comes out of the model, uh, suggesting the right practices based off what a company has instantiated and said, these are my best practices. So honestly, and, and I think this is gonna be across general AI. I do not think we're unique in any way, shape or form. I think really the, the next level of adoption is all about uh, personalization and control over these models. And that can be done a lot of different ways. And that's actually going to kind of be the interesting piece is there's a lot of different ways of going uh, about that. And they're coming up all the time. So uh, there's six or eight ways to do it now. I mean, probably by next month, there will be another one. So there's always newer ways to 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 make these adoptable and build trust in into these models uh, and, and on the output. Brennan, thank you so much for taking time out today. Talk about not only Tab9, but the whole evolution of this space. Thanks for great insights. And I would love to have you back on the show, uh, but I really appreciate your time today. Thank you. Likewise. Thank you. And I'll, um, 